Hey, welcome back. This week I got something a little different. This is a vintage uh, Philips. Philips made in Holland, not just Philips. Philips made in Holland. Um, cassette recorder. And uh, actually this is funny because I was digging out something else to do uh, a video on and then this was in the way. So I picked it up and I says, where did this come from? Oh boy. But uh, it's typical for electronics of this age, you see the the badge plate, the glue is just kind of disintegrated to dust and no longer holds it on. So we'll have to re-glue that. But uh, even the front here, I think this is loose here too, I think. I was playing with it earlier and this fascia plate was loose. But let's look at this. This is really unique. Um, this is This is really early, early cassette technology. Um, Philips was the, was the company that developed the compact cassette back in 1962, I think they started developing it. And I think they, um, they patented it and, uh, marketed it back in 63 or 64, something like that. But there were, uh, you got to imagine back at that time, it was an emerging technology. It was kind of like, this is kind of like our smartphones today. This is real cutting edge stuff to have a box this size holding a little tiny cassette that you can record music or voice and have a self-contained player and recording device all in this little box. It was quite a feat in, uh, in electronics for that, uh, for that period. Even though today we look at it and it looks pretty crude, but uh, believe me, it was, it was cutting edge back then. And uh, this is a very early model and I expect it has germanium transistors in it. I know when I was a kid, I had lots of uh, these cassette recorders, um, you know, get them as gifts or whatever. And, uh, you know, they had uh, evolved into what we would call a, a, just a cheap toy, but this isn't, this isn't cheap. This is a well-built, well-built device. So let's have a good look at it. Um, speaker, obviously and the the bay for loading your cassette and uh, your capstan pinch roller doesn't look too bad might well it's going to need a clean for sure and the and the, uh, the capstan is needing to clean looks like the head is all bent out of shape that is a very early head i wonder if i can get this off That looks like a very early head and it looks like it's all bent up. I might have to take a good look at that. And it has an actual erase head um, to do the erasing of the tape before it's recorded. Um, a lot of the cheaper tape players or tape recorders just had a magnet that would swing into place and rub up against the tape and that would crudely erase the uh, signal that was on it previous. Uh, I got a red button here which I assume is a record button, but it doesn't press down, interlock here, there it goes. So if you don't have the erase tab on your cassette, it's not gonna go. So this is a play. That's fast forward, rewind, it doesn't lock. And then it's got a, a nice feature here, it's got like a, a meter now this is probably a dual duty meter. This is probably your battery meter and your record level all in one. And this is another thing that was uh, cutting edge back in the days to get a miniature meter that size, uh, miniature electronics. It was really, um, it was really, I don't know. It, we don't appreciate those things today, but uh, back then this was really exciting stuff. Um, it's got a speaker output. It's got the goofy German or European speaker uh, connector, and it's got two DIN pin, tin, two DIN plugs. I don't know what they're for. One's marked one, marked two, five pin, and that's a six pin. Two level controls. I suspect one's recording the red one, and the other one's playback. It's a very nice uh, plastic case with this brushed. Aluminum trim all the way around. 
very nice design. Very sharp. Back in the day, this was, uh, like I said, it was pretty exciting stuff. Okay, battery compartment. I don't know what this is. That might be a re re part we might have to repair. It takes one, two, three, four, five C cells, it looks like. And uh, let's look at this here. If you can see this, there's a model number here. It's called an EL3302 slash 52G. 7.5 volts and it's got a serial number it doesn't have watts or voltage because it's not an AC powered unit it's got a I don't know what that is some black grease or something looks like that's the motor there let's uh, take the back off and see what we can do with this All the old Phillips had the slot flathead screws. Uh, that was their kind of a trademark, I guess. Oh yeah, here we, uh, that's what that was. That's belt. See this belt? It just disintegrated to uh, a sticky mess. So we'll have to clean that out. And here you can see parts of the belt. Looks like there's two belts. So we'll have to get some belts in this thing. What is this? It's either a part of a cookie or it's some foam that turned to petrified uh, crust. So it's got two circuit boards. Really nice construction, really quality, uh, quality printed circuit boards for that time. There is no date marking on this whatsoever, eh? I don't see anything. Wow, so we're gonna need some belts for sure. Stop, play, fast forward, rewind. well constructed. It's got like a steel chassis. It's a stamped steel chassis. Very nice. Let's um, let's take out these screws and pull the... Uh, actually first what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up this mess with this belt. Okay, you know what? This is going to require full disassembly and cleaning because that those belts, they disintegrate into sticky tar and it's everywhere and all these, it's just everywhere and it's making a mess. So I'll, uh, we'll get to that. But let's continue looking at this. I just had this cover off because I was cleaning the pulleys. Get this back together first. So I was looking at this and it looks like it has a mixture of silicone, silicon and germanium transistors, but I'm not sure entirely. But let's have a better look at the chassis. I've always admired the European uh, vintage electronics from this era. They, they put a lot of effort into building design uh, you know, designing and engineering and building a quality product. And then the, you, you look back then and then the, Ch the Japanese came along and they, uh, they tried to undercut everybody by making uh, the same product at a cheaper price. And um, they, they knew how to, uh, what fell? They knew how to, um, build things down to a price, that's for sure. Oh, there it is. 
Is there any more screws? There should be one more. Why isn't this loose? I think I might have to pull this knob off. That's probably not the right way to do it. I think that's the only way it goes. Okay. Let's see if this comes off. Yes. Check out this speaker with the square magnet. It's pretty cool. as I expected that fell off. Let me re-glue that as well. And all the knobs fall off. So that's the record knob. This is a volume knob. Another volume knob. This came from here. So we get to see the cassette mechanism. These tires look good. I'm surprised by that. Usually they'd be cracked and broken by now. This is uh, cutting edge miniaturized electronics back in 1965, I guess. It's even mounted on a little suspension spring to protect it from shock. There's no dates on this whatsoever. Screws loose. See, we got the European germaniums here. This is an AC-187. But then it looks like we got a Motorola silicon here. It's a ON255. I don't know. I should look that part number up. Here's another one. It's got an odd case. This here is the um, the motor speed regulation. Here's a little adjustment, there's a series pass transistor. And I'm looking at the schematic here. That's this circuit down here in the corner and that's for the motor. So there's a lot of electrolytics in here I'm looking at. 25 UF, 25, 200. 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. What else is there? 40, a 40, a 40. So that's 600. Can't really see that. Here's another one that microfarad I can't read. 25. So I expect there's going to be a few bad caps in here, I don't know. So I guess first step is to get these flywheel, these pulleys out and get them cleaned. So that's going to be my first job here I think. So I pretty much had to disassemble the entire mechanism to get the pulleys out to clean them. See even this one's not that clean yet. This one here I had to really scrape in the groove because it was some kind of sticky residue that stuck to the uh, metal. And uh, you know if you leave that stuff there you're going to get wow and flutter in your, uh, in your audio. So I had to go through and clean it out pretty much with a scrub pad. And um, 
do that but right now I'm just going to do some rubber renew on these tires. All these tires are actually in really good shape. I'm really surprised. This one's got a few cracks on it. Minor cracks. I'm just going to leave it alone. It's still pliable. I'm just going to do some rubber renew to clean these off. It just pretty much just strips off the surface of the old oxidized rubber and then uh, put this back together with some lubrication everything's going to get re-lubricated and I was really surprised the condition of the mechanisms were the lubrication on them were still holding out but uh, since we got it apart we're going to do this anyway we're going to do the pinch roller See, the pinch roller is quite dirty. Let me get some more on here. I'm uh, just about ready to select some belts and put them on, but I'm having a little trouble here. I don't think I have the right sizes. I'll get to that in a bit after I get this done. Pinch rollers really benefit when you use the rubber renew, cleans them right off. All that stuff that the alcohol won't even touch. Just do a couple of, and you got to scrub it down too, just to get the that top layer off, and it exposes fresh, fresh new rubber to uh, grip. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Still getting stuff off of it, but it's got a little bit of a flat spot right there. I think it was left in the play position. Hopefully that won't be a problem. If it is, I can I suppose I'd have to change this pinch roller. Let's lubricate this while we're here. See how it spins? It has a bit of a, it sounds like it's dry. So let's put a little bit of the HX1. See if I can get some of this out. There we go. Good thing about this needle is you can get in there and you can get it right where it needs to be. There, that's better. Okay, I'll reassemble that. On the other side here. Got one tire. I can get the This one. That should be clean already. I'm still getting rubber residue. Where's it coming from? Oh, there's a piece. You know what? There's a piece of belt stuck in the resistors here. I'm going to have to dig that out because that's recontaminating my wheel here. Hang on. Okay, I got a little dilemma here. I got belts. This is my smallest belt I carry. It's a 2.3 and it is too small. And my next size up is a 3 and it's too big. So I have to find something in the happy medium in between those. I think about a 2.5 or 2.7 would be good. Um, I'm just going to dig through my belt stash here and see if I can find something. I don't know. A lot of these are 
something like this maybe I don't know it might be too big yeah that's too big Let's see what size this is well that's a three point three point five I think let's try and find some other ones thing is all my belts are small belts or big chunky ones I might not have a belt okay I just going through reassembly and there was one thing that I found that is a problem on this chassis I don't know if you can see this this is where the um, capstan flywheel and the capstan go there's a couple of bearings here well, actually they're bushings sorry bushings uh, there's a bronze bushing on this side bronze bushing on this side and this holds the flywheel it's heavy heavy flywheel holds it in position um, the problem is it's loose I mean you can see that it's loose and uh, I need to secure that because it can't be loose and it looks like it's just crimped on to the to the frame I, I think this is just pot metal this 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 uh, housing that holds these two bushings so what I want to do is I want to just restake this so it kind of stops wiggling around and uh, gets back to holding it again but things are falling apart here so what I plan to do is I plan to just punch it with a chisel if I got a chisel here I think I do chisel and I just want to re-punch that and uh, see if I can get it to hold but I have to make sure that I don't damage everything else when I strike it so what I want to do is put this on a socket and uh, I'll have to put this on a plate or something to hold this put this on a plate and put this on the socket Now I need to get something under here to hold this up. Let me put the camera on pause, I'll get this all set up. Okay, I think I'm all set up here. I got it sitting on the aluminum block. Got it still perched on that socket and it's all supported so it's not flopping around. I just want to take a punch. It's a flat headed punch and just grab some of that metal that's there and see if I can stake it do it four times now this is in the way do this side And one more time. Okay, that should be it. Now let's have a look at it. Yeah, it's solid, it's not moving anymore. Okay, that's good. So we'll put it back together. Get a belt on it and let's start uh, trying things out here. We need to lubricate this. looking good I wanted to point out this motor you can lubricate both sides of it There's open bearings on both ends look at the um, attention to uh, detail Phillips did back in the 60s they put two ferrite beads 
over the motor wires to suppress uh, interference. Isn't that kind of cool? Okay, now we need to get a belt. Get these wires out of the way too. How come these wires are in the way? Hmm. Alright, managed to find a belt. Uh, this is a square belt. This one is, I think it's nine. Yeah, nine inches. 26, 23 centimeters. Yeah. Seems to fit fine. Put this in. Some wires in the way. Good, it's got enough grip and torque. I think I'm going to take a Q chip and clean it. Better if you can get the motor to do the work for you instead of doing it yourself, right? I just want to clean the. I just want to clean the contact surfaces on these belts, just to make sure they're clean. Looking better already. They were dirty from storage too. This small belt is, uh, I believe it's, what's my smallest size? 2.3 and it's a little too small, it's too tight. Plus it's a little too big, it's like a 2 millimeter belt where it should be like a 1.5 or maybe even a 1 millimeter. But uh, it's going to work. And then I'll get this cleaned up and then we'll finish the assembly. Okay. So, this is the motor cover. This part here. Okay, I got three screws, and you can see it's adjustable. Oops. You can see it's adjustable, so... You just want to adjust it just so that tip... This is rounded here, this tip. It's like a ball tip on it. Just touches the uh, plastic bearing. And if you want, you can even put a little dab of some grease on there just to give it a little bit of lower friction not, not necessary but put this back together okay I'll uh, get back to you when I have a get back to you when we'll uh, start the electrical uh, testing okay it's back together mechanically and uh, I think I got everything in the correct position in place there's one thing I hear I don't know about is the lock for the record function. You have the locking tab on the back of the cassette. There's a pin that senses that and it, I thought this was supposed to be spring loaded, but uh, 
I might be wrong on that one. There's a button here. It goes like this. Right, and that locks the button from pressing down. And then we insert a cassette that has the tab in, still in, on the back. It uh, shifts this lever and then you're allowed to press that down all the way, which you probably can't see in the camera, but there's a little interlocking there for the, um, actually, I got this in the wrong position here. Okay, you can't see underneath there, but there's a little locking tab that uh, will lock in the record switch. So when I click it forward, the record switch moves with the, the assembly. And when I pull it back, it releases. But I don't know about that yet. I might have to look into that. But there's one other thing I wanted to point out here that's a problem. Not really a problem, but it's kind of an issue. And I'll zoom in and I'll explain. I don't know if you can see this pulley, it's sitting all cockeyed. And um, I'm going to do this through the viewfinder. Uh, you can see on this side of the pulley, it doesn't quite line up with the, uh, the flywheel. And this side of the pulley is high, this side of the pulley is low. And this is a plastic molded piece, so that can't be the problem. Problem is, this post here, it's probably bent. Probably got pushed down uh, or bent for some reason. And you can see it's just a little steel post that's put into the chassis and it's stamped to lock it in. I don't know if I want to put any force on that to bend it back um, because I don't want to loosen. I don't want to loosen this for one thing and have that go loose on me. And then the whole assembly would be wiggling around and I don't know if it's that bad to condemn it from working it'll probably work like that I think better just leave it alone and uh, we'll see how it runs okay so I got um, everything going here I haven't put power to it yet so let's do that right now I'm going to find something to rest it on other than this carpet because uh, we'll have belts and stuff dragging and we'll power it up, hook up a speaker and see what we got. All right, so according to the battery configuration, this here is negative and there's a wire that runs into the switch assembly here. So that's gonna be my negative. And this one here, even though it's a black wire, it's a positive. So I'm going to put that as pause, make sure it's shut off first. Okay, so we got power. Now let's look up the speaker. Let's flip it over. Let's look up the bench speaker. And we have a volume control here. We'll put one on just so that we can adjust it. It's set to zero. And I think that's it. Let's try it out. Okay, so play is functioning. Yeah, it's dragging on the paper. It's got a fair amount of torque. It's pretty good. Rewind, nice and quiet, smooth, rewind, fast forward, play, sounds good. Let's get a cassette in this thing. I didn't, I didn't hear any noise out of the amplifier, so let's turn this on again. And the amplifier is totally quiet. kind of a concern because you should hear some kind of a pop or something. Anyways, let's try tape. I don't know what this is. I think it's the police. It was recorded in the 80s and the ink from the 1980s has faded to nothing. This side you can't even read anymore, so it's a mystery. Let's try this side first. Mm, 
we got no audio. Okay. So we got to diagnose why we got no audio. Let's um, try this first. I think there's a switch in here that uh, switches from external speaker to internal when you plug it in. So I'm just going to bypass this. And we're going to try picking a signal off of this little connector. And we still have nothing. Okay. All right, so we're going to have to dig into the audio amplifier. If we can figure out where the speaker connects, I can see the output transistors. If we can figure out where we got a missing signal. Touch with a screwdriver. Turn this up. It is up. Completely dead. There's no sound whatsoever. I'm just using my body capacitance as a to inject this a signal in. I should be able to hear a hum when I hit uh, an active circuit, but I'm not getting anything. Everything's totally dead. Okay. Let's see if we got voltages here. Leave that on. Let's put this over here. We got our ground. Three point six. Oh, why I'm feeding it seven point five volts, by the way, and it's drawing. 80 milliamps. So we got voltages in the power amplifier. Should be enough there to do the biz, but it's not doing anything. Hope it's not dead transistors. Please, please, please. Don't be that. So we've got voltages all through this amplifier. Except I'm just checking random spots here for different voltages. And we got power all throughout it. Here's 7.5. Okay. I don't think this has an output transformer. Let's check the uh, schematic. Hmm. 
Yeah, no output transformer. So I think our first steps would be check some of these transistors, make sure none of them are dead. And then uh, maybe the switch too, because this switch has a lot of interconnections throughout the amplifier. We can see some here. I can't barely read the numbers. Some here. And they correspond to these pins on this switch, I imagine. Hmm. Let me pause camera and think about this one. So I managed to wiggle out the PC board. This is really tight with these wires. They, they don't give you much wiggle room. This is about as far out as I can swing the board. Um, I'm looking at this switch here. I, first of all, I did test a couple of capacitors. This blue one here is testing good. This green one below it is testing open. Now, I don't know. This is a 560 microfarad at 10 volts. And I think this is probably the main capacitor for the unit. 560, I don't see it on here. Unless it's this one, that would be on the output to the speakers. We, you'd think we'd get some kind of noise through it. 560. I can't even read that. And this is the output of the amplifier right here. And then it's switched between, um, I think this is the record head. Let me see this diagram here. Yeah, I think this might be the record head because this is the record level. And this might be the erase head. It's got three wires on it. The erase head only has two. Our playback head has three wires. Okay, so that's maybe a clue. This is the playback head, record head. And this is the erase head. But that capacitor is still a mystery to me. Let me see. I don't see any large. Here's a 200. Right here. I don't see any other large capacitors. And this might not even be the right. I don't even think this is the right schematic because I don't think I have germanium transistors here. I think that's a silicon. That's a silicon. And I think there's one buried there and then these three are germaniums so I might not even have the right schematic here so let's pull out this green capacitor if that is in fact in series with the speaker I can tell where the speaker wire is this red wire here is a speaker wire so if I can see how that connects up and yeah it connects to this green capacitor or does it? It's certainly hard to say. Let's pull that green capacitor out and see what it says. Okay, so I got it out. Let's try it up. It's a little bit corrosion on the negative side, but not bad. It's physically, it looks like a good capacitor. Let's try it in our tester here. And it comes back at 33 nanofarads and an ESR of 310 and climbing. That's uh, for a 560 microfarad down to 33 nanofarads. I don't know if a signal would pass through that. You would think a little bit of speaker noise would squeak through that, but we'll uh, replace that and we'll see what it does for us. All right, I don't stock any 560 microfarads. It's a standard value, but it's an uncommon one. I don't really carry them. The closest standard value I got is a 470. 
And it just so happens I have some of these because I bought a bunch for upcoming uh, Harmony Card and Citation. I got a bunch of Citation equipment that needs recapping. So I'll put that back in the cap pile and we'll scavenge one of these for this project, a repair. So let's put this cap in, see if it makes a difference. There's not going to be much difference between a 470 and a 560. Uh, you know, I could go to a thousand, but I'd rather just do this. I'll solder this up and get this, see if this works. Oh, another thing I wanted to go over is this um, mode switch is really, I think, an issue as well. Let me see if I can zoom you in here and show you what I'm finding. This is the mode switch, and it switch be switches between record and play, and it's really sticky and stiff, like it's got Looks like it's all soldered. Oh, it's gold plated on that side. Why is this soldered on this side? But I'm going to give this a good cleaning because I think uh, it needs a little help here. Maybe we're not getting good connection and good contact. So I'll clean this up, the switch, get it some deoxid on it, and then we'll put it back together and we'll give this a try. Yeah, I'm really puzzled by this. If you got gold plated. Uh, contacts on your PCB board, why would you coat them with solder, which would be uh, detrimental to what the gold does. But anyways, let's uh, coat this with a fine bit of deoxid. Too much on there. Get a little bit on the gold side too. I suspect there's contacts on both sides. And give this a go. Now the only thing I don't know is the positioning because uh, this lever here determines the switch position. I guess we can power it up and then slide the switch back and forth. Okay, that should be good. Let's power it up. We've got a speaker still hooked up. Positive, negative. Still not getting anything out of the speaker. Okay, we're going to have to start testing transistors now, I think. Alright, so I'm not entirely sure what I did, but it seems to start working now. I had uh, the PC board out and I was cleaning the switch and I was moving it back and forth to work it and get the contacts clean and I was not getting any sound whatsoever. Um, I thought maybe it was this ground screw, this ground was missing, so I regrounded it, nothing. Um, I would, could get it to play the amplifier to work, not play, but the amplifier was working when I had the switch in a 
a certain position but that was just a flash and then it disappeared again I couldn't get it to work so what I did is I just uh, put it back together again and now it's working I don't know understand what's going on here but here I'll show you we got the volume at three and a half what is going on now seems like a motor speed it was working perfectly before I happen to think it might be that there's a, uh, a reversing switch in here and I think it might have been dirty contacts and it's starting to work its way clean. Now we got the right speed. Now we got the right speed. Something weird. the other side. Working. I don't know why we had the wrong speed there for a second. I don't see any loose wires or anything that's going on. Something happened here. Something's flaky on this. What's going on here? This glue. I might have a broken head wire. That's what I'm ho hoping I don't have. See, now it's quiet. Is that the mode switch? Now it's working. Maybe it's getting erased. It's getting quieter. The tape's damaged maybe. I don't know. I don't know the quality of this tape, so let's... Police is still playing.
something is messed up with this switch back here, I believe. I'm going to try attempt to clean it. And then we'll see what we can get. Okay, I cleaned the switch and it seems to be behaving a little better. The pots are nice and clean. I didn't touch them. No scratchiness. Seems to be working good. I don't know, the speed sounds okay. Maybe a little bit fast. It's hard to say. See, it still does that. I don't understand why. Unless that transistor is flaky. There's two transistors here. It seems like it's a bad connection. Something on this board, maybe. This is the speed regulation. Hmm. Interesting. Look into this some more.
that's odd. I don't understand why sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I'll have to get deep, deeper into the speed regulation circuit here. I don't see any cracked solder joints. Uh, just with the naked eye, looking for my eyepiece here. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll maybe I'll just re-solder this board. There might be a bad connection on it. It's hard to tell. These solder joints look not too bad though. But uh, it's almost like it's got no ground. There's two wires going into this. I'm assuming one is the power wire going in, one is the motor wire going out. And then there would be a ground. It shows three wires on here. Uh, where is the ground? The ground is this one. Ground goes to the emitter. This goes to the motor. And this is power. Looks like it's a negative. From the battery, goes to this DIN plug. Maybe there's a problem with that DIN plug. I don't see any bad connections on it. But it might have a it might have a switch inside, embedded switch inside. Let me look at this closer. Okay, I was flexing the board and it started working again. But then it's also started smoking. So uh, I think I blew up a transistor here, I'm not sure. It started drawing three quarters of an amp from the power supply and smoke started coming out. So let's uh, just disconnect this. It's marked right here on the board. M plus for the black wire and plus for the gray wire. So I'll just remove these two. And we'll see what's wrong on this board. I don't know if we've got a bad transistor now. I might have shorted something out. I know this resistor was dragging on the flywheel and that might have grounded something out and uh, caused a whoopsie. Put this aside and have a look at this. Six ohms. And that should be 12 ohms. Oh, there's two of them. Yeah, there's two of them in parallel. Okay. So that's right. This one is uh, blue, red, brown. So that would be six, 620 ohms, I think. behind it is green, blue, brown, which would be 560 ohms. And that one is right here.
Got a 270 ohm resistor here. There's 270. And the last one, what is that? Gray, red, brown. So that would be an 820 resistor, 820 ohms. So what remains? These two diodes. Check these. Transistor, we got base emitter, shorted. No, that's not the right connection here. Okay, that and that. Switch these around. That transistor might be bad. This one here. Base emitter collector. That looks good. That looks good. That one might be okay. That's actually the uh, the motor driver transistor. This one here, I suspect. So let's pull that out. What is that? It's an AC something. AC is covered with a piece of tape or sh sheathing. Oh, and then of course we got our trim pot. Okay, let's pull that one transistor out and have a look. Okay, so I removed the motor regulator board and I pulled one transistor and I tested it. This is an AC127. Have I mentioned I hate working on germanium equipment? You know, it's just kicking my ass, this thing. Silicon transistors are so easy, either they short or they go open. And when they fail, but germaniums have a different failure mode. They just do weird stuff. And it's hard to pin them that down, especially when they're intermittent. So anyways, I pulled this transistor out. I tested in this tester. Take that off. This is an NPN uh, germanium. Keep that in mind. So let's see what this says. It's going to say something different this time. I hope you can read that. Why is it so washed out? Anyways, it says uh, by junction transistor NPN eight, uh, HFE gain is 137. Uh, collector current is 1.9 milliamps. Voltage base emitter is 115 millivolts. So yeah, it all looks normal, right? You would expect. Now, if I go with this one, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these before. This is a cool little thing. I like this. I picked this up decades ago and um, I should actually show you how it works after but uh, if you're ever looking for one it's it's a 22-025 and it's a little transistor tester there's no active components in here all it is is passive uh, components has got a potentiometer a switch an LED uh, some resistors capacitors and a little transformer inside and what it does 
is it takes the transistor under test and puts it into a circuit and uh, puts it into oscillation. And if you can get a transistor to oscillate, I guess it's considered working. So I forgot what my pins were. I'm going to have to adjust the screen on this. It's really dim. Okay, so pin one, two, and three is collector base emitter. Okay, collector base emitter. So we know those pins. Let's click connect up our connect up our clips. And with this, you need to know whether you're testing NPN or PNP because you got to flip the switch yourself. So I'm testing NPN. Turn that down. Okay. So what you do is you crank this and start increasing the base current until the transistor starts to oscillate. And you can see right around 70... Where is it here? Right around 80 it starts to oscillate and the LED starts lighting up. And if I keep increasing it, it gets brighter and brighter. Then it hits a point right around 30 where the LED goes dim again. And then when I increase it to zero, it goes bright. But um, it shows it's working. So let's... Uh, change this a little bit. Let's heat this transistor up. This is the part I don't like about germaniums is they're so difficult to test and uh, reliably reliably um, get them to show their faults. So I heated that up a little bit comes on at 80, no change. It's gonna make a liar out of me today. Let's try some cold spray. Can you see that LED lit? Oh yeah. See now it's okay. Let's cold spray this thing. Let's see how this does. Comes on at about 72. Yeah, it's going to work now. See, this is the problem. But when I was testing it before I turned the camera on, this thing was doing all kinds of weird stuff. It was uh, cutting out and uh, dropping out of oscillation. But I'm going to change this uh, transistor. It is a um, it is an AC one twenty seven. AC 127 MPN. It's got a va uh, voltage base collector voltage of 32 volts, emitter base voltage of 10, voltage collector emitter of 12. It's got no current listing. It's got a gain of 50 plus. It's got a collector current of 500 milliamps. Capacitance we don't care about. Frequency you don't care about and it dissipates 340 milliwatts. It is, uh, where is it? There we go. Oh, here it is. It is this transistor here. And this transistor sets the bias. There's the adjustable pot here. And uh, yeah, this is a series pass transistor. This is the one that handles the current for the motor. This one is the um, driver for it. And the other transistor, I should actually take this out and I should test it as well. 
although I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'll take it out and test it and we'll have a look at that one as well. This is an A. Well, let's pull this out if I can pull this out. AC128. And we'll test this one as well. AC128 is a PMP, it's the complement. It can handle up to one watt. AC128K, this isn't any. No. Okay, so I'll do that, pull that transistor out. My goal is I think I can just take these germaniums out and put silicon transistor back in their place. I don't think it's critical. Um, the biasing will be adjusted by the pot and um, it's just a simple regulator circuit that um, controls the current to the um, motor. So it's a speed, crude speed regulation uh, regulator. And I don't think substituting silicon for germanium is going to make much of a difference just uh, other than maybe a little bit of a tweak here to get the speed correct. So let's try that. I'll pull this one out and test it. And uh, I think I might just uh, put two silicon transistors in here. And just for comparison, this is a silicon uh, 9014 transistor. This is common, common transistor they use in a lot of Chinese, Japanese electronics. And it's marked emitter base collector. So let's hook up our lead space is in the center. And I'm not sure if this is NPN or PMP, but we'll find out. Uh, the red one's collector. And the black is our emitter. Okay. So let's uh, switch this to NPN, increase the gain. See right around. 45, it starts oscillating and it goes up from there and that's a good transistor. You put it to PMP and it does nothing, right? And usually the higher up on the scale you get, the higher the gain in the transistor. But I was up at around 45, and that germanium was around 80, so I don't know what's going on with that. I don't think it's supposed to have that high a gain. All right, I think I finally got this uh, mess sorted out. What I've done is I replaced this NPN germanium transistor with uh, silicon. And once I did that, the motor ran slow, and I had not enough range of adjustment to speed the motor up to normal sound. So what I did is I started playing with the biasing and um, first of all what I did is I shorted one of these diodes just to change the biasing here and what it did is it slowed down even more. So next step I inserted another diode in series with the other two and everything's now normal. I can fully adjust it within the range uh, that it needs to be and the motor control circuit works normally and uh, we substituted a silicon transistor for the germanium. We just had to change the biasing by adding one diode and increasing this voltage drop. So I'll just put it all together for now. I have it in pieces still. I'm going to put it together and uh, clean this up and then we'll uh, get on to uh, setting the tape speed and um, trying this out. All right, I'm back and I got the board modified and installed right here. And um, three diodes in series instead of two. Let's do a speed calibration. Let's first test it. It's working. So I got a frequency counter here. I'll hook it up to the speakers. 
Hope it's got enough signal to trigger. And we got a speed calibration tape from fixyouraudio.com. Little plug there, if you haven't noticed. Okay. Yeah, my frequency counter is not picking this up. I gotta take the speakers off. There we go. I'm still getting 20 kilohertz. Let's crank this up. Oh, I'm getting like 8 kilohertz here. make any difference which way it's connected. Okay. So my frequency counter will not lock on this. Is this not strong enough signal? There's just too much other noise. Let's use a scope. Okay, I got a scope hooked up, and uh, it's not on the screen, but it doesn't need to be. As you can see here, we are at 3.38 kilohertz. So I'll turn this down. There we go. Three hundred. Pretty darn close. All right, let's try it out. Rewind this. Let's get our speaker back on and turn down the volume. And it's dead. <laughs> Drawing 20 milliamps. There's something still flaky here. Last time when I was flexing this board, it was. Uh... Let me try flexing this board again. I'm beginning to think there might be a flat spot on the motor. I hope not. I don't get it. Why doesn't it work? Okay, I got developed another problem. I think it's got something to do with the silicon transistor replacement. So I got a situation where once I set the speed, come on, do something. I turn it on. Once I set the speed, um, when I shut it off, I turn it on, I get no motor. And I was checking around with the voltmeter. It just doesn't seem to be any voltage on the motor whatsoever. 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what this circuit does, but if you give the motor a kick, it takes off, right? And then uh, it runs normal speed. But if I shut it off, turn it back on, it does nothing. So I was wondering, what the hell's going on here? So I took a little capacitor, and uh, this here is, this gray wire is battery voltage. This is a motor wire. So what I did is I just took a little capacitor, and this is actually a one microfarad, 50 volt. Touch it across here, and it works. Some, it just has a little bit of a kick to get that circuit alive and working. And then it, it comes alive and it bounces out and everything's working properly. So I think I might have to install this capacitor um, here. Let's try it here. Let's solder it on. Positive is this one. Okay. Let's tack a capacitor on here and see what it does. Okay, one microfarad. Nope, doesn't want to go. Seems to be working now. So I did a capacitor between this wire here between here capacitor and here and that seems to smarten it up because otherwise it didn't have any uh, any output voltage to this motor. I think I might have this voltage drop here a little too high since this is the battery I think. Let me see here. Yes. Negative supply comes through one of these two switches to this. This is your um, B minus let's call it. And this, uh, let's see here. Where's ground? This is ground. Ground. So between B minus and the motor, put a capacitor, it seems to smarten up. Now I don't know if there's room in the case for it. What I might do is take this capacitor off, maybe try a disc cap. Small disc capacitor would be better than this big can. Remove the capacitor, doesn't work. Let me get another capacitor and try it. Okay, here's a half a microfarad capacitor tacked in there. And it doesn't seem to be reliably starting because sometimes it won't start. Like that, it won't start. So I'm going to stick with a one microfarad and then uh, I'll have to find room on the board probably from the other side because I don't think there's room here for the uh, Oh, there might be. I wonder. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's going to be room. All right. So what I did is instead of mounting the capacitor on this board, as I mounted it back here by the switch, where the, there's more room, and uh, that'll work. It's just same set of wires, just a different location, and uh, it seems to work. I don't have anything dragging on the belt. Nope. And it's working.
set to the right speed. So I'm gonna leave it at that and put it back together. Put it back in the case, in the housing, and uh, we'll give it one final test after. All right, so the last thing I need to do is fix this battery connector. There's two leafs and they fit into a slot down here, but they're loose because I think they're bent. You can see they're bent. So I'm gonna bend them back Straighten them out a bit, give them some spring tension, and then just shove it in. And it should hold. Oh, that's nice and good and tight now. Okay. Excellent. Everything's back together. I think we... Uh, Got another one saved. This is a unique uh, tape recorder because it's it's one of the first ones built in the world by Philips. And like I said at the beginning, Philips is the manufacturer that developed the compact cassette. If you go onto Wikipedia and look at look uh, search for compact cassette. You'll find a picture of this very same tape recorder on there. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'll link. A, I'll put a link down at the bottom of the page there, and uh, you guys can go check it out yourself if you want. But yeah, this one's done and it's working, and it's a pretty nice unit. It's missing the microphone, of course, and uh, the case, and uh, a lot of that is gone. But it is a nice working unit. So, all right, thanks for watching, and um, I think it's get back to the Harman Kardon gear because I kind of drifted a little too far away from that, so I'm going to get back. Got a bunch of citation equipment here to look at and work on, and I got some receivers, and I got a Pioneer receiver that's been sitting on my floor collecting dust. So I got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff coming up. So, yeah, thanks for watching, and stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you again in the next one.